Yeah.
208. Number 208. Shall I tell you why the seeds from falling pastures away from sin was because the love of my Redeemer, only one, my heart to live. This is why I love the
Praise is mentioned in the Bible a lot of times. You can't get away from it. No. We're supposed to praise the Lord. And if you look into it, don't, you can't cheapen this one and say, well, I'll do it by living a good life. The actual terminology means a spoken word. It means to speak it. And it says to praise the Lord. But I want to challenge you to a little different than just saying praise the Lord, which I've always kind of just said, what are you actually meaning by that? Because the word praise has a meaning. It means to glorify or lift up as a favorable opinion. So I commonly every day, just about, will say to one of my friends, God is good. That's praising the Lord. When you say to someone and they say, how are you doing? And you say, the Lord has given me a good day. Or you say, I have found a lot of mercy and strength and grace in God. You're, you're lifting him up. Years ago, I worked for a survey outfit, and, and my boss had put me on this job that looked like it was pretty impossible to do, and I prayed about it, and the Lord allowed me to do a very good job on that, and when that was turned in, the day that my boss was talking to the ones I had done it to, one of the other, my buddies was in there, and he comes into the other room, rolling his eyes, and said, boy, the boss is in there singing your praises. Well, he wasn't in there jumping up, praise for him, praise for him. He was actually saying, he's a good conscientious transit man, and he'd done a good job with what he had. Giving it as a good opinion. Do you know when I was challenged with that, I started watching our, and listening to our services very close. And we, we, we praise the Lord with all of our testimonies, with all of our songs, with, with all that we do. We're, the, see, I chase the reality of serving the Lord. I, I don't want the facades. I, I don't want to just jump up and say praise the Lord and, and, and not have anything. God is doing something for me. I want to say, if, if God takes me tonight, I have had a very, very good look. God has blessed me more than I could ever deserve. He has been so good to, to us. He's healed our family for years and years. He's brought healing to us. He's brought health to us in every way we can. He financially has took care of us. God is good. Amen. God is great. He is a healer. Do you know that when, when you say, God healed me, you're praising. Who else can do that? God. God is our healer. God is our helper. I want to challenge you to be someone that praises the Lord. It doesn't matter to me whether you jump up and, and, and holler, praise the Lord. That's a part of modern, the modern world cultural, Christian culture, to, to praise the Lord that way. I'm not sure it's what the psalmist meant. But I'm not sure it's what the other writers meant when they said, I will praise the Lord. It means that I'm going to tell the world, God is good. He is a great father. He's a great command, uh, companion. He's a great provider of our, of our lives. He sticks closer than a brother. You know that's praising? We, we, we know I've got a friend that's sticking closer than a brother. That's a praise. That's a good opinion. God is so good of it. You know, he's merciful. I've made a lot of mistakes. I, I, I have counted on God's mercy so many times, and he's been merciful to me. And there's times that the, I went to the Lord and, and absolutely counted on this, that he said he loved me. God loves you. What a praise to say that when I'm talking to people that don't know the Lord, I want to tell them, Brother, God loves you. What a praise to say. We say, well, I'm too bad to love. No, I'm going to give you a higher praise. Our God loves you anyway. <laughs> you can't get bad enough when God don't love you. You can get bad enough. We might not, but you can't get bad enough when God won't love you. So praise is in our everyday conduct. It's in mean, our language. It's praise, our songs to be praise the Lord. So I just want to challenge us. If you want to praise the Lord, but praise the Lord. I, listen, I'm really not trying to bend it at want to praise the Lord, praise the Lord. We know what you mean. But I think there's a greater meaning to praising the Lord that goes beyond all of that, that it is a, 
an experience of my life of what God has done to me for me and if I was going to praise my wife for being a good wife and for I would say but my wife is an excellent cook I mean that is a praise to say she she has these qualities I wouldn't just holler pray in the middle of a crowd holler praise Linda you all probably would think I was crazy for doing something like that but I can tell you and give honor and glory to her that she is a very industrious she's got qualities and that's what we do for the God because there's none like it so I appreciate the Lord and I want to in my life I want to praise the Lord in that and every day and every day in the contact I have with the people around me I want to praise the Lord I want to be able to give them a good opinion of the one that's favored. Appreciate the Lord. Well, it's time to go to prayer. So, anyone in here have Thanksgiving before we go to prayer? How about an unspoken request that you might not want to mention? God knows every heart. Anyone have a request they'd like to speak out? I'd just like to thank the Lord for letting us be here. Say it again. I'd just like to thank the Lord for letting us be here. Uh, well, we're glad you're here. Here for my mom. She's come down with the shingles and she's had rough nights and can't hardly. She's in pain a lot. She was having, uh, she was in pain earlier when she texted me. Just remember, she, remember her and her. She had a good night tonight and we cleared up the things with that. Lay me on a surrender's prayer request. The Lord will bless this deed.
uh, singers with the Barton to sing, and uh, there'll be space in the for that after prayers. Well, if all requests are in, maybe we can look to the Lord. So one thing is in prayer, please. Remember the service. given each one of us. We thank you for the beautiful weather that we have. Thank you, Lord, for being such a good and loving God. The scripture says that you give us richly all things to enjoy. The scripture says that it's your good pleasure to give us the kingdom. Lord, we're thankful for all of your blessings and for being such a good and mighty and gracious God to us. Lord, we're met here tonight Pray that everything that's said and done here tonight will glorify you. Lord, I pray that you would send your spirit down and touch every one of our hearts. We've already gotten a blessing, Lord. I pray that your presence will continue to be with us through the remainder of the service and tomorrow and the days after. There are other camp meetings that are going to be following, and I pray, Lord, that you would meet us in every one of those. Lord. I pray that you would speak to every heart, that you would bring everything that's needed, encouragement or reproof or correction or knowledge or whatever, conviction, Lord, whatever is needed. Lord, there are requests that were mentioned here, um, several that are afflicted. Uh, Sister Cheryl, Sister Janine, um, can't think of all of them right now, Lord, but we heard several names, and we know that you are a mighty God, and we have seen your power, and we have seen you work in many miraculous ways, many times, Lord. Lord, I, I pray that you would meet every one of these individuals tonight, and give them exactly what they need, and encourage them, Lord, and we would love to see you heal them, and we know you're able, Lord, and pray for your work around the world, and people that are endeavoring with all of their hearts to worship you in countries that are far more restrictive than this one. Lord, we thank you for the freedom to worship you like we do, but we know that there are many people who are not able to do that. I pray that you would go there, and that you would give those people special strength, and Give them the words to say where they can shine light even to the people that are their enemies, that they can show forth your love. Lord, there are wars going on in the world right now. I pray, Lord, that you would protect your people over there who might be caught in the crossfire. I pray, Lord, that your, the light of your gospel would be able to shine there and that the wars would cease and that there would be peace, Lord. I pray that you'll help us here where we are, that we will know how to effectively reach others in our community, how we can be a light for you in our place of business, in school, in the store, wherever we are. Lord, I pray that you'll help us to know how to reach the world today in 2024. Lord, I pray that you'll help us to not be distracted by the things that, by the phones and everything on them, and all of the things that Satan has to offer, Lord. I pray that you will help us, that we can be focused on you, Lord. Please be with us this evening now. In Jesus' name, amen.
blessed me. I'm thankful for everything he's done. Let's pray for you. Every morning when I wake to see the sun, I can't help but think about the Lord and all the things he's done. He meets my every need. You know he's been so good to me and I can't help but praise the Lord. Glad to be here this evening. I'm Eric Newell from uh, the Prague, Oklahoma congregation. Desire your prayers and the courtesy of your attention. You know, the, the exhortation before prayer, the praise that we have to give to the Lord, the song, I think it goes well with the topic that I want to look into this evening. If I had to put a title on it, I would call it The Intimacy of Christ. Uh, looking around the room, and I've noticed this in other 
congregation, you see people sitting close together, but then you see spaces. And usually it's pretty safe to assume that those sitting close together are in the same intimate with each other. They know each other. They're usually family or friends. But then you have the spaces for the people you're not quite as close to. And when I think about Christ and what he's done, looking back at Christ, you read his ministry. You know, Christ went about doing what I call wonderful miracles, of wonderful displays of miraculous feats. But you know, he didn't do them up on the stage. He didn't go into a town, have them roll a wagon up, and, and build a podium, and, and put an announcement out that, you know, at, at 5 o'clock we're going to have a miracle over here on 3rd Street. Christ didn't do that. Usually when he did a miracle, it was with smaller groups, all the way down to the individual people. There were crowds involved sometimes, but the miracles that he had to do were specific. They were intimate for the person that it was involved in. And I really appreciate that about the Lord because sometimes, you know, our world today likes to, I'm going to call it, manufacture scenes and, and manufacture emotions. Uh, I was listening to... I hate to use the word testimony, but that's what the person called it. They were a minister that had left the faith of a, a group they were in, and they now profess to be an atheist, and it was their explaining for why they walked away. And I was curious, why would you walk away from the ministry? But in that particular movement, the person said it was all designed manipulate their emotions. They had the big stages and, and they would play the music and they, they had it just figured out at what time to raise the music up, what time to lower the music, dim the lights, when to put the fog machine on, all to manipulate the feelings of the crowd. So that the crowd would feel something that may or may not have been the spirit. And it disillusioned them and they walked away. Because there was no intimacy between them and the Lord. And I thought, oh, how sad. How terrible. But the one thing that I do love is the Christ I know. Folks, <laughs> he knows me better than any of y'all, including my wife. That's right. When he called me to, to preach, and I, I still have the, the list. He gave me a list of ten things to work on. Ten specific things. And I felt like he told me, before you can move out, you've got to address these ten things in your life. And some of those things were only the things only I would know. But he put them out there and he said, This, you wanna, you wanna work for me? You gotta fix these things. Very specific, very intimate. So I'd like to go look at a case of Jesus dealing with the person. We're going to start in John chapter 9, starting in verse 1. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind men with clay and said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. And he went his way therefore and washed and came to see. Now I like this story because if we look at that, it starts off with... I'm going to call it the characters of the story is the blind man. He was born blind, blind from birth. We have the disciples who are the close acquaintances of Christ, and we have Christ himself. And his disciples and him are apparently walking along, and they see this man. This man apparently was well enough known by the disciples that there was a common teaching that if someone had been born with difficulties, then somebody had sinned, either them or their parents. 
And so the disciples asked Jesus, well, here's a man that was born this way. Whose sin was it that caused this? And Jesus is like, no. He was born this way so that I could show my power. There was no sin involved in this man's life. And then part of it that I've, I've often been amused of, I, apparently this man was with an earshot. Because it says Jesus then turned around to this man, spits in the dirt, makes a mixture of it, puts it on the man's eyes and tells him, now this is a blind man, remember, go across town to the pool of Siloam and wash. You know one thing I find interesting in this? He didn't tell the blind man he could see. But I'm thinking that blind man had heard the whole conversation. Well, this man was just talking about some people were born this way so that God could show his power. And now he's put something on my eyes. Blind people have good hearing. He probably thought I heard it spit. And if you put that on my eyes and it's telling me to go across town and wash. Now, why would I do that? But this man also is talking about God's power. And this blind man went across town and washed, and it said it came see. Now, <laughs> I love that because, you know, Jesus started off, this, this whole thing starts off with a very intimate situation. His disciples asking him a question. His disciples trying to learn. But he ends up with this, this man being healed of his blindness from birth, and now he's coming back and continuing on in the 8th verse. It says, The neighbors, therefore, and they which before had seen him, that he was blind, said, Is this not he that sat in bed? Some said, This is he. Others said, He's like him. But he said, I am he. Therefore, said they unto them, How were thine eyes open? He answered and said, A man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed mine eyes, and said to me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed, and I received sight. Then said they unto him, Where is he? He said, I know not. So here we see that we're starting to, to see a little bit more people get drawn into this event, this miracle. The neighbors, the people in the community, they happen to look up and I can just see this man walking down the street and the neighbors potentially noticing, hey, look at how confident he's walking. He, he's not, maybe got his, we, we had the walking canes for a lot of the blind people nowadays. He may have had a stick back then. He's, he's not tapping around trying to find his way. He don't have his hands out front looking to feel. He's just walking like he can see. Walking around, people weaving through the crowd. You know, it caught their attention. Yeah. And they started saying, hey, look at him. And some naturally said, wow, that's impressive. He's that blind guy. But the others were like, no, it can't be. It has to be somebody that just looks like him. And I love it, but it says, he said, I am he. I know who I was. I was blind. And I can see y'all. I have my sight. And of course, curiosity. Well, you know, there's something intimate sometimes when you talk with your neighbors. And so they're asking, well, how, how'd that happen? Well, this man named Jesus, you know, he he came by and, and made clay and put it on my eyes and told me to go wash, and I washed. And I received my sight. And, and they said, well, where, where is he? So I don't know. And I had to chuckle. You know, he didn't know where Jesus was at. He was blind when he walked away from Jesus. He had no idea which way Jesus went. Because until he got to the pool and washed, he couldn't see. He didn't even know what Jesus looked like. But he knew one thing. The man named Jesus did this. It wasn't a random man in the crowd. I know Jesus did this. So going on, starting in verse 13 and continuing some more. 
they brought, to, they brought to the Pharisees him that aforetime was blind. And it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then again, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He said unto them, He put clay upon mine eyes, and I washed and do see. Therefore said some of the Pharisees, This man is not of God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Others said, How can such a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. They say unto the blind man, What sayest thou of him that he hath opened thine eyes? He said, He is a prophet. Now I find this interesting that the neighbors, <laughs> we got a guy healed. And he says this Jesus fella did it. You know, Jesus was starting to get a reputation in the community by then. And so these people said, well, we don't know where Jesus is at. We're going to take him to the Pharisees, to the religious leaders of our day. And we, we want their opinion on this. And so the religious leaders look at it. And, you know, they ask him about it. He tells them. And, and you know, the religious leaders started looking for a way to discount a miracle. Why? Were they intimate with Christ? No. He was a name they'd heard. And so they start looking, well, according to our law, you're not, in, in the Jewish teachings, there's a whole list of things you're not supposed to do on Sundays because when the Lord was creating the earth, there was a bunch of things He did when He rested on the Sabbath day. Basically, if you do anything that would be considered creating something, you're not supposed to do that on the Sabbath. If you mix water and clay in their minds was creating something and therefore illegal to do on the Sabbath. And so even though you have a man born blind from birth that's now walking around seeing, they get hung up on Jesus made clay on such. And, and they, they really you know, well that's he's sinner. But now some of them are like, hold on, we see the miracle. How can somebody that's a sinner do this? And then there's a little squabble going, and and you know <laughs> they they go back and forth, and and we're going to see in a, in a bit that you know they're they're going to call some people in, and and there's a fear of the people of the religious leader. Let's continue on here. It says, but the Jews did not, but the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called his parents of him that had received his sight. And they asked them, his parents, saying, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then doth he now see? His parents answered him and said, We know that he is our son and that he was born blind. But by what means he now seeth, we know not. Or who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age. Ask him, he shall speak for himself. These words spake his parents, because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. Therefore said his parents, he is of age, ask him. And this, you know, to me, we see his parents. They weren't around what happened either. They knew their son. They knew he, he was the one born blind. He was seen now. But when it comes time to say, well, he said Jesus did. They, they, had to, they didn't have that connection. And so they, they said, we don't want to get caught up in this crossing lines with the Pharisees. So uh, he's of age. He's old enough. You ask him. He knows what happened to himself. You get it from him. And continuing on now, verse 24. Then again called they the man that was blind and said unto him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered and said, Whether be he a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know that, whereas I was blind, now I see him. Then said they to him again, What did he do? What did he to thee? How opened he thine eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and ye did not hear. Wherefore would you hear it again? Will ye also be his disciples? 
Then they reviled him and said, Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. You know, this is, to me, the man has, he's already told the neighbors. He told the Pharisees the first time. He obviously had told his parents. His parents told the Pharisees, you've got to get from him. They come and all he is like, look, I know what happened. This man, Jesus, healed me. You all keep asking me to repeat it. Y'all going to follow him too? Sounds like he was a little over all the questions. It's like, I, I know what happened to me. I know exactly what happened. I mean, on that end, he tells them, have y'all ever heard of anybody that was born blind seen before? Hasn't happened, has it? How come y'all are struggling? He, he really was wanting them to understand that I had a special touch from the Lord. And He healed me. And I can see. But isn't it strange how the, dare I say, the rest of the world He was around couldn't see the miracle because they was hung up on their different ideologies. Could not see a walking miracle because, well, it, it crossed this little rule over here. And the reality of some of those rules is they didn't come out of the Bible. They came out of men getting out and discussing and that thing. But he had had a personal touch with the Lord. And, and John dropping on down there in John 9, chapter 9, verse 34, this is the Pharisees. They answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. Now I find this interesting. They resorted back to the very question of doctrine that had started the whole thing. You were born in sin. That's why you were born blind. Somebody was born in sin. You were born in sin. Why are you talking to us? That's the very first thing that started this. The disciples that asked the question. Here's this man. Based on what we've been taught to understand, somebody had sinned. Who, who was it? And Christ had said, no one. He was born so that I could show my power. And yet, the Pharisees, probably without even knowing the start of this whole thing, go right back to that teaching and try to use it to completely discount the working of the Lord. Completely remove it off the face. And so, you know, they cast him out. Can you imagine what that might have felt like? To be told, they're no longer a part of the congregation. <laughs> You're no longer a part of us. You gotta leave. You can't fellowship with us. But let's go on now and keep reading in verse 35. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found them, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him. And it is he that talketh with me. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. To me, this shows the beautiful, wonderful, intimate nature of Christ. You know, he had no doubt, knowledge, that what he was about to set off by healing that guy, touching his eyes, giving him sight by going and washing, was going to cause problems for him. The devil doesn't like that in the world. But at the end of the day, when this man is cast out from his community, the Savior just didn't say, well, that's the price. The Savior went back to him. Hey, you want to be a part of my community? Do you want, do you want to be a part of my community? I'm the Savior. And the one you been hearing about for centuries was going to come and save the people? You've been kicked out of one community. Guess what? I'd love to make you a part of this one. And that man, 
Well, yes, Lord. I would love to. And Jesus said, we're talking to you. You're talking to the Savior. And that man worshipped him. You know, Jesus' claim to be the Son of Man, that, that was blasphemy. That was dangerous terms to use, even back then. And yet, that man was looking around, and he's like, you touched my eyes. You did something no man could do. Only God could have done it. And imagine being able to finally, he can see now, and he's looking at the Savior's face. With the full understanding of you, you healed. You fixed what I couldn't fix. You took care of what I couldn't take care of. Face to face with the Lord, He worshipped Him. You know we have other records of people who have shared their moments of intimacy, I'm going to call it. Think about the Apostle Paul. His story of his conversion. Going down the road to Damascus, the light shining. Others saw the light. They heard noises. But you know, that wasn't for them. That was for the Apostle Paul. Saul, Saul, why can't you stop this? Who are you? Jesus, the one you're persecuting. You know, the, the Lord, he had been looking at the Apostle Paul's life. I don't know about you, but I'm just going to put my human thinking cap on for a minute. If I had been a Jew or a Christian at the day, watching what the Apostle Paul was doing, I would have not thought this guy's going to be the next good preacher for the Lord. I'd have been looking at the Pope. I sure would like for something to happen to that man because he's just terrible for Christianity. Just terrible. And yet when the Lord was talking to Saul, he's like, I, I've got a mission for you, Saul. I'm going to turn you into a preacher. I'm going to send you out to convert more people to my way. He was looking at a part of Saul that nobody else could see. As a man, I wouldn't have been able to see him. I would have been like, hey, eyes. Lord, you want me to go bring her who? He's killing me. But the one thing I love was the Lord's response to that question. Yeah, but he prays. And I need you to go to You know, even in that, we see the Lord's intimacy. He didn't just randomly give five people a feeling that they needed to go find Saul and pray for The Lord went and touched a person and said, I want you to go pray for Saul. What other records of, of Ananias' life do we have in the Bible? I'm not aware of it. And, you know, I, I think about it. He apparently wasn't a big preacher. But, you know, his willingness to go be intimately used by Christ has impacted all of us. Because of what the Apostle Paul has done. And to me, that's the beauty of, of the intimacy of the Lord. Is he's looking around and he's looking at each of us. He's looking at you might be absolutely in the throes of sin. And he can still see, I can use you. I have a place for you. I have a work for you. I just have to get through to you. Think of the story of Stephen being stoned after his message there to the Jews. And it said as he was being stoned, he looked up and he saw Jesus standing on the right hand of God. You know, as he was suffering and dying, as the rocks were flying, Jesus wasn't far removed from the death of his saint. He was intimately watching him. Hold on, Stephen. You're almost home. You preached a good sermon. It's a, 
It's going to hurt. A few more licks. And then I'm going to put my hand out. I'm taking you home. Amen. And you don't have to worry anymore. Your work is done. Your home is safe. We have the story of Nathaniel, who Philip had went and said, Hey, Nathaniel, Nathaniel, you need to come see the Christ. We found the Christ. Yeah. <coughs> and Christ getting there. And Nathaniel coming up, and Christ mentioned it. Hey, yeah, Nathaniel, there's an Israelite in whom there's no God. And Nathaniel's response was, Wait a minute, how do you know me? And I love the response because we do not know what happened under this fig tree. But Jesus said, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Whatever happened under that fig tree was intimate to the Daniel. Because his response to that statement from our Lord was to admit to Christ. You're the one. Nobody else could have known I wonder what kind of prayers or meditations he had been in that had the attention of the Lord drawn that close to him. And then knowing that, Philip, can I impose on you to get a woman to go call my family on here? I really want to meet you face to face. Isn't it just beautiful the way the Lord works, the way he comes together? I look at all kinds of things in the Bible. And there's people that will look at God and look at Jesus as if they're high and lifted up and remote. Just watching us humans try to do things right. Potentially making a mess of it. I've been challenged by what Brother Marty said a bit with the, the, the praise. Folks, when I look at my life, I work with men in prison. And I've told more than one of them some of them have been in for murder. The only reason why you aren't meeting me in prison, the only reason why I'm on the outside, is just because of what God has done for me on the inside. I had a temper as a kid, folks, and as a young man. You say something that I didn't like, and, and my first reaction was to talk about it, I just go to sleep. And with an anger like that, I. I can tell you, looking back, I realize that that would not have come under control from the Lord. I would be probably sitting in jail for mass slaughter or something, or even worse, premeditated murder. But the reason I'm not is because the Lord reached out to me intimately. He said, I want to work with you. I want, I want you to, to learn to trust me with yourself. And he's been so good to me. I look back over my life and the things he's done. He's protected me as I've traveled around the world. He's protected me as I've made unwise decisions and helped me get out of them. And folks, he is more real to me today than he was when I first met him. I think of other folks. I think of the, the, the gentleman that uh, had had all the devils in his legion. And it said after he was saved from the devils and Jesus was leaving because the town folk had come out and said, we don't, we don't, we don't want you sticking around. You're scaring us. And it said that man wanted to go with him. But Jesus said, no, I want you to go home. And I want you to share what's been done to you. Do you know that it's that intimacy that will make a story ring truer than one that is just, well, there was a man one time and something happened to him and something good happened or bad happened and, and this was the result. Those stories are okay, but I think of the, the blind man and the neighbors. I don't know if that's the, the guy that couldn't see or not. But he's like, I am he. I can see. This is 
to everybody in that story, it was so real to him. He knew what had happened. He knew how it had happened. He understood it had come from God. That was the only way it could have happened. And that intimate love from the Savior just, you can see it in the story, set his heart. Nobody could deter him. To the point after multiple questions, he's even telling the, the religious leaders that the others were afraid of. He's openly challenging them. Are you going to believe on him too? Now I've never seen a blind man blind from birth get healed before. But I'm standing in front of you. Y'all ready to believe too? But they didn't have that in the knowledge of the Lord. They were caught up in, in looking at things and crossing things. Our Lord today absolutely wants to build an intimate relationship with each and every one of us. And He wants to keep it getting deeper and deeper over time. He wants to, dare I say, bring in new Apostle Paul's into the congregation. But you know, he also wants to bring in a new analysis too. People who, for the most part, just in the background, praying for folks. You know, that's a gift. The gift of prayer. We sometimes call them prayer warriors. I love the Lord for everything that he's done. I love him for what he continues to do for me. I would beg any of y'all to see if you do not have a true, intimate connection with the Lord. Reach out to Him. Reach your hands out to Him. Let Him know you want Him. He's willing to give it to you. He loved the whole world so much that He left heaven to come down to earth. And in Holly Hill, the, one of the ministers mentioned so that he could be made complete by suffering. So that he could truly understand what we went through. So that he could truly be the best advocate for us with his father. What kind of love is that? And to put it in perspective, in heaven, I'm going to say he would have had a head knowledge of suffering. Because he couldn't suffer that. But he was willing to step out of heaven to a realm where suffering was possible and then actually suffer in ways that many of us never would. All so that at the end of the day he could turn around and say, oh, by the way, I want, to, I want you as my adopted brothers and sisters. And I want to split my inheritance for eternity. You don't bring people into your family just because you pick random people. I think of all the adoptions and things I've been around, those were intentional. You get to know the people and you get the families get to know each other and, and you want to make sure things are going to work out. It's intimate. And then eventually you get to the day where the, the legal adoption papers are signed. When I did work with some of the foster programs and the CASA programs in the past, those children, at the days when they realize I'm about to legally become a child of these parents of mine, oh, they look forward to that day. That's the day they celebrate. And folks, the Lord is like, I want to bring help in my family too. I want to work with you to get you to where you can mark the day. This day is when the Lord brought me into his family. And then we can celebrate. Y'all pray for me.
You know, Jesus deals with us right where we're at. Uh, you remember when the man came to Jesus and said, would you talk to my brother about an inheritance? Jesus dealt with him, not his brother. Do you remember when Martha was complaining about Mary? It never said Jesus said anything to Mary. He dealt with Martha right where she was at. Jesus one time was in a situation and there was a lame a man and Jesus makes a statement or something like this which is it easier for me to say thy sins be forgiven thee or take up thy bed and walk that you might know that I have power to forgive sins take up your bed and walk now I don't know if you've ever thought about this it's not novel to me I got it from a commentary but Jesus was taught was dealing with those people right where they were at they believed the 103rd Psalm 3rd verse who forgives all thy iniquity and healeth all who healeth all thy diseases they believed that God would forgive you then heal you and that was the evidence of it and so Jesus hit them right where they were at and and you know it was either going to be the great blessing to them or a stone of stone. They had to then, what do I believe now? And Jesus said, take up the bed and walk. Do you know what I heard in the message tonight was a, me a message that encouraged us to sincerity. If you want to be uh, victorious in your life and you, and you want to be successful in living the Lord, you must be sincere. Because the Lord is going to deal with you right where you're at. And he dealt with them right where they was at. And they should have said, when he said, take up thy bed and walk. And he took up his bed and he walked. They should have said, my Lord, my God. Yeah. That's what they believed. It's what they said they believed. But when he gave it to them, he dealt with them right where they was at. They rejected it. Now, when the man said, I love the verse. When the man said, will you be his, his disciples also? I don't know if you all catch the humor in that. that I don't know how, how intelligent this but I'm telling you, that was the thing to say. Because they was trying, they wasn't sincere, and they were trying to get this man to say something that wasn't true, so they didn't have to deal with it. Because you know what they had to deal with? Being his disciples. That's what they had to deal with. This man healed a man that had never seen in his lifetime. Nicodemus was so sincere that he approached the Lord and laid down all of his arguments to start with. You think about it. Nicodemus said to, to come to the Lord and said, Master, we know thou art of God. No more arguments, Nicodemus. Well, how can you argue now? Well, if I was the first thing I was going to do in an argument was to say, I know that you're of God, for no man can do these miracles. I just surrendered my argument. He was sincere enough to surrender his argument. Now, he went ahead. I mean, he wanted to understand, but he surrendered. Jesus dealt with every one of these people right where they were at. And... The disciples fell miserable on the chance that they had to accept the Messiah. There was those that didn't think he was, was a perfect example. He looked at his faith and what he believed inside of him and he said, No, no man can do these miracles unless God be with him. This man's of God. He has to be. And so I heard in my what I got from the message tonight was a message of of, of Sincerity, be sincere in the Lord. I don't have to know everything. I don't have to be capable of everything. But if I'm sincere, the Lord can lead me through anything. The Lord can take me through anything and show me anything. And I appreciate the message. Sister, we're very sorry.
And she wanted uh, prayer. She wanted to be anointed. Is there any other word of duty before we just go through it? I believe there is a posted schedule if you're interested in that, just as you go out the door, uh, other than me uh, risking uh, making a failure here or something wrong, it's posted back there on the door. If you just look at it as you go, it has a time frame. Is there any other word of duty? Help us in all these things. 